Hello, we can start. Um, I'm Patrick Elias, I'm a retired Court of Appeal judge. I still sit sometimes, but I'm basically a retired Court of Appeal judge. Uh, as you know, we're having this discussion today about the Privacy International case, raising absolutely fascinating issues. It's always important that the Supreme Court gives clear guidance, and they have done by four to three uh, in this case, uh, the four giving two different strands of reasoning and the three dissenters giving another two different strands of reasoning. And it's worth pointing out that the th Court of Appeal, three members of the Court of Appeal, agreed with the minority, not the majority. And the divisional court, two judges, couldn't agree with each other. Apart from that, clarity is the key in cases <laughs> like this. It, a, an important case, of course, that it deals with is Anna's Minnick. And I notice in the front row is Professor Feldman. We have a man who's written in very great detail on that case specifically. So I'm sure his observations will be worth listening to, in addition to the two who are speaking today. Two very distinguished professors, uh, but are you ever allowed to say that a professor is not distinguished? Have you heard people say, this undistinguished professor? <laughs> anyway, these are distinguished professors, uh, Mark Elliott and Alison Young. Mark is going to speak, well, each of them is going to speak for 10 or 15 minutes. Mark is going to focus on uh, the sovereignty, parliamentary sovereignty aspect of the decision. And Alison's going to focus on uh, questions of abuse of power and the rule of law. So we'll start with Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit first about the case generally in the background, including what the, uh, the lower courts um, made of the, the issue. Um, and then I'll, I'll focus on uh, what the Supreme Court said about um, parliamentary sovereignty. So um, I think that we've got a mixture of probably different year groups in the in the room. So for those that haven't looked at this case yet uh, in lectures, I'll just say a very little bit about what the, the issue was. Um, so the uh, Investigatory Powers uh, Tribunal had uh, made a decision um, essentially holding that the Secretary of State was permitted to authorise computer hacking on what's called a thematic uh, basis, for example, in relation to classes of, of people. And Privacy International was seeking to challenge uh, that uh, finding, that, that judgment of the, of the IPT. And its central contention was that the tribunal had misinterpreted Section 5 of the Intelligence Services Act, 1994. But for us and for the, for the court, the, the crucial question was whether, as a preliminary matter, whether this case could be brought at all. Was there any possibility of challenge in the regular court to the IPT's decision on this point? Why might there not be the possibility of that kind of challenge? Because of Section 67 of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000, which at the time provided that except to such extent as the Secretary of State by order provides otherwise, determinations, awards, orders and other decisions of the tribunal, including decisions as to whether they have jurisdiction, shall not be subject to appeal or be liable to be questioned in any court. Now, Section 67 did leave open the possibility for the Secretary of State, by order, to provide for an appeal route against the IPT decisions. But that had not happened, so there was no possibility of appeal. And the question, therefore, was, was there any possibility of judicial challenge by way of judicial review? If the answer to that question was no, then IPT decisions such as this one would be wholly immune from judicial scrutiny. It's worth adding that since the, these issues arose, the legislation has been revised and the position is rather different. But at the time, this is the situation that the courts were presented with. So in the absence of a right of appeal, was there a possibility of review or were the IPT's decisions wholly protected by, against scrutiny by the ordinary courts? So what did the ordinary courts make of this issue? Um, as Sir Patrick uh, said, it started out in the divisional court, which was effectively divided so Sir Brian Leverson said that he thought there was a material difference between this case and Anna's Minnick. And he placed particular emphasis on the nature of the decision-making body in question. Whereas in Anna's Minnick, the foreign compensation had been a public body uh, exercising administrative functions, 
the IPT was a judicial body which was itself exercising a supervisory jurisdiction over the actions of other public bodies. And for Sir Brian Leverson, this made a critical difference. It was a point of distinction with Annas Minnick. The IPT itself was a judicial body, and that made the, that made the issues uh, different in terms of where the balance lay. Uh, in terms of constitutional principle. And I'll come back to this point in a second about this idea of balancing different principles against each other. Now, although he didn't formally dissent, if he had, that have been a 1-1 one, one tie, uh, at which point apparently a, 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 a larger court has to be constituted, um, Mistress Leggett did have serious misgivings about the approach that Sir Brian Leverson had adopted. He said that exempting the IPT from judicial review would render it a legal island, and that would be inimical to the rule of law because it would have the capacity to make decisions, including decisions about the law and the meaning of the law, and there would be no means available to anyone to question or challenge or correct those decisions. So we have a stark difference of opinion in the divisional court. When the matter reaches the Court of Appeal, Lord Justice Sales says, actually, this is a very easy case. Um, it just raises a short point of statutory construction. We have Anna's Minnick, and Anna's Minnick tells us generally how we interpret ouster clauses of this nature. And then the question is simply, is there a relevant difference between the ouster clause that the House of Lords had to look at in Anna's Minnick and the ouster clause that we have to consider in this case. The linguistic difference is that this ouster clause refers to decisions as to jurisdiction. And the question is whether or not this has any, uh, makes any difference in terms of how we look at the meaning of the clause. For Lord Justice Sales, it did make a difference. He said that this means that all decisions even if those decisions are founded on erroneous understandings of the law, are made immune from review by this ouster clause. So what we see if we combine Lord Justice Sales' judgment in the Court of Appeal and Sir Brian Leverson's judgment in the Divisional Court is two different ways in which Anna's Minnick is being distinguished. Lord Justice Sales places particular emphasis on the nature and clarity of the language which is in play. He attaches weight to the, to the, the additional words in this ouster clause, decisions as to jurisdiction, as distinct from the ouster clause in Anna's Minnick. Whereas Sir Brian Leverson placed particular emphasis on the institutional difference between the two public bodies that were the potential subject of judicial review. One was a public authority exercising administrative functions. One was a judicial body exercising a form of supervisory jurisdiction. So that's the lie of the land as the case um, arrives in the Supreme Court. Before I turn to the Supreme Court judgment, I want to frame it by asking what's really going on in cases about ouster clauses. What I think is really going on is that we have three key constitutional principles which are brought into relationship or tension with each other by the particular device of an ouster clause. We have the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. What is it that parliament wants? We have the principle of the rule of law, which requires access to court and judicial uh, curation of the law. And we have the separation of powers, which has things to say about what the role of courts is, among other things. Now, when we uh, en encounter an ouster clause, we encounter a set of questions in relation to these principles. How far is the court willing to deviate from what would appear to be the plain meaning of the statute? How clear has Parliament made its intention? How much pull do the different constitutional principles exert when the court is, is weighing the extent to which it is acceptable or necessary to deviate from what we might think of as the plain meaning? And how are these different considerations to be reconciled? It's the fact that these things are brought into focus and tension with each other in ouster clause cases 
that, that often takes us so close to the constitutional bedrock when we think about these kinds of issues. So against that background, what did the Supreme Court have to say? It was, it was confronted with two questions. In effect, what was the effect of this ouster clause? And secondly, and more generally, is Parliament actually able to oust judicial review by means of ouster clause? It's a specific question and a general, um, even hypothetical uh, question. On the particular question, uh, Lord Carnworth, who uh, gave the judgment of uh, three of the four majority judges, so the leading judgments, if you like, said that a decision that's vitiated by an error of law, whether as to jurisdiction or otherwise, is no decision at all. So for Lord Carnworth, the addition of the extra words in this ouster clause, as compared to Anna's Minnick, didn't cut any ice. He said that if Parliament had wanted to be clearer, it could have been. And the fact that it wasn't clearer meant that he was entitled to infer it hadn't really meant to exclude judicial review. He pointed, for example, to a 2003 bill which tried to oust judicial review by, re by referring to purported determinations, echoing the language of Anasminic, that were vitiated by reason of lack of jurisdiction, error of law, or any other matter. He felt this was clearer and that in the absence of language of that degree of clarity, he was entitled to draw the inference that he did. Lord Sumption, one of the judges who dissented, took a different approach. He said that the degree of elaboration called for in a statutory provision designed to achieve a given effect must depend on how anomalous that effect would be. And by anomalous here, he means anomalous in constitutional, in particular, anomalous in rule of law terms. To what extent, if we gave natural meaning to the provision, would we end up with the results that placed the rule of law in jeopardy? On Lord Sumption's analysis, the rule of law was not placed in serious jeopardy by an ouster clause that prevented review uh, in these sorts of circumstances, because, to begin with, the IPT had a status and character as an independent judicial body that made it, in the first place, something that was there to protect the rule of law. What do these contrasting approaches tell us about the principle of legality, the principle of interpretation, whereby fundamental constitutional values are protected? Certainly Lord Sumption's approach suggests that the potency of the principle of legality will turn to an extent on the extent to which the rule of law is threatened by the legislation in question. Would the rule of law be offended by the investigatory power tribunal's immunity? The more we think it's offended by that kind of state of affairs, the more the court will strain to find an interpretation of the provision that leaves judicial review, at least to some extent, in place. Now, what about the, the broader question, can Parliament oust judicial review at all? This was the elephant in the room in Anna's Minnick, but it wasn't the elephant in the room in Privacy International. It was right there in front of the Supreme Court because they were asked this question explicitly. Not all of them agreed to engage with this, but many of them did. The most striking statement we find in Lord Carnworth's judgment, he says it's ultimately for the courts, not the legislature, to determine the limits set by the rule of law to the power to exclude judicial review. And in saying that, he's echoing the kind of language that we see in earlier House of Lords and Supreme Court judgments like Jackson and Axa. So it's not, it's not unprecedented to see this kind of suggestion made from at the apex course bench. They want to press a little bit further on this point and to distinguish between two different ways in which this question can be looked at. And in doing so, I want to draw on a framing device that Lord Sumption introduces in his judgment. Lord Sumption draws a distinction between two different senses in which a limitation on Parliament's ability to exclude review might be rationalised in constitutional terms. The first approach is what we might call the radical or the normative view. This is the view that holds that Parliament is subject to a higher law as ascertained and applied by the courts, that that higher law prevents the ousting of review 
and that an ouster clause is therefore not really valid law because it offends this higher law. So that's one way of looking at this. The second way is in a less radical way or a conceptual way. On this view, says Lord Sumption, judicial review is necessary to sustain parliamentary sovereignty. Flipping that the other way around, ousting judicial review is an affront to parliamentary sovereignty. Why? Because if we are to have a meaningful system of law, a system of rules that can genuinely and meaningfully be called a system of law, then it's a necessary precondition that there exists a system of independent courts capable of interpreting and curating that body of law. Without that, Parliament denies itself the ability to make that which can properly be called law. This has echoes, and indeed there are explicit references to, Lord Justice Laws' judgment in Cart, where he insists that judicial curation of the law, that, or rather the insistence on judicial curation of law, is not a denial of sovereignty, but an affirmation of it. We see similar sentiments in Lord Reed's judgment in unison. Without access to justice, he says, laws are liable to become a dead letter. The work done by Parliament rendered nugatory, and the democratic election of members of Parliament may become a meaningless charade. So resistance to ouster clauses, not as a limitation of sovereignty, but as a realisation of parliamentary sovereignty. So that, that, that's the lie of the land. Now, what did the judges say about these two different views? Lord Sumption was very clear in rejecting the normative view. Lord Sumption says that sovereignty applies as much to the courts as to anyone else, and that requires that courts give effect to parliamentary legislation. Even Lord Carnworth, I don't think, unambiguously embraces the normative view. He says that the courts are not addressing in this case the difficult question that might arise if Parliament were to pass legislation purporting to abrogate or derogate from accepted rule of law principles. That's a slightly puzzling statement, given that that is exactly what the second question raises, but, but, but there we go. So the normative view is rejected by Lord Sumption. I don't think it's, it's squarely adopted by Lord Carmel, but I'll suggest it when I finish in two minutes now uh, that I think he actually does really come around to that view. What about the conceptual view? Well, Lord Sumption, I think, to an extent, embraces it. He says that if Parliament creates a body with limited powers, it must have intended them to be effective and hence enforceable. It could escape that conceptual difficulty by making plain its intention to create a body of unlimited jurisdiction, but there's a strong presumption against it doing so. So in the vast majority of cases, conceptual reasoning will justify judicial resistance to ouster clauses. Lord Wilson embraces the conceptual view very clearly, I think. He says that if a true jurisdictional error is in play, and Alison might say more about different senses of jurisdictional error, then there's much to be said for recognising the conceptual impossibility of ouster. Lord Carnworth sort of aligns himself with that view, but he says that he thinks that uh, this would apply both to excess and abuse of jurisdiction. So I think in one sense, Lord Carnworth here is aligning himself with the conceptual view, but in doing so, I think he's presenting as what you might call a normative wolf in conceptual clothing, because in effect, what Lord Carnworth is doing here is moving as well beyond judicial review in terms of the four corners of the power. And he's saying that whenever any of the grounds of judicial review is made out, thereby establishing an abuse of discretion, this then triggers the kind of conceptual reasoning that enables us to resist the ouster clause. So finally, where does this leave us? Is it telling us that there's a limitation of sovereignty or is it elaborating the meaning of parliamentary sovereignty? I think that it turns on whether we favour and think that the court is favouring the conceptual or the normative analysis. But Lord Carnworth's judgment, I think, reminds us that that distinction is not watertight, given that the notion of abuse of jurisdiction can be presented in conceptual terms but actually imports what might be thought to be normative restrictions on what Parliament can do, which of course then links in uh, with the, the foundations of the Thank you.
you. I'm afraid I don't have slides, so you'll, you'll just have to listen to me. Um, what I want to do is to pick up where uh, Mark Elliott left off and want us to think about some of the consequences. We've looked a little bit about the consequences for parliamentary sovereignty, but the two other areas I want us to explore a little bit further. One is thinking about the rule of law, and the other is thinking about conceptions and justifications of judicial review. So I'm going to look first at the rule of law and then move on to thinking about how we justify actions of judicial review and how it works. So with regard to the rule of law, there are two aspects that I want us to think about, because I think there are two aspects of the rule of law on which you get disagreements across the justices of the Supreme Court. So if there's one takeaway, it's don't expect there to be one answer to any of these questions. What you've got instead is a wide range of views across the different justices of the Supreme Court. So when we're thinking about the rule of law, we're often trying to think about it in terms of what is its content. How far do we think it's formal? How far do we think it's substantive? This case isn't going to help you on that. But what it is going to do instead is give you a different idea of the importance of the rule of law and the role it plays in the Constitution. And then from that, an understanding about different consequences of its content. And it's those I want us to think about. So when we're thinking about the importance, we've seen that in the way that uh, Mark Elliott talked us through the case. So you have these different understandings of what is the rule of law doing when we go away and think about its role in the UK constitution. And we have this distinction that Lord Sanction draws between the more radical view and the less radical view. And you can see that running through the cases, not just in terms of what they're thinking about whether there can and cannot be an ability to have ouster clauses writ large, but also in the way in which they approach the more specific question. What do we do with this specific ouster clause here? So if we go away and look at Lord Calmworth, he's using the rule of law much more as a foundational constitutional principle. So his starting point when he's thinking about whether you can have this particular ouster clause is to go away and think about what does the rule of law require? And he thinks about it in terms of what pragmatic and principled restrictions will the rule of law place on a particular ouster clause? And that's his focus. So the rule of law is being much more foundational. We're using the rule of law to draw background constitutional principles to help us to think about what role ouster clauses should play in specific circumstances. When you go away and look at Lord Sumption's approach, which is less radical, the rule of law is playing a different role. So the rule of law is a principle of the constitution, but it isn't playing the same foundational role when you're going to go away and try and find out specific aspects of judicial review in these circumstances. So we do have to think about the rule of law, but it's tied into this background principles of parliamentary sovereignty. So what is the rule of law there for? It is about making sure we have governance according to the law. It justifies the need to have courts to go away and carry out a form of review. So if you were in a situation where you're completely removing all forms of judicial review, you might have a different outcome because then you're not supporting parliamentary sovereignty. But when you're looking at restricting judicial review in a very narrow set of circumstances over a particular court or tribunal, then you might have a different outcome because you're going to spend more time looking at the legislation and what parliament empowered that tribunal to do. And then the court's job is to go away and uphold it. So you have a different focus. What is the job of the investigative powers tribunal? What does the legislation tell us about its role? We then go away, look at its functions, look at its role at taking these decisions, special procedures of secrecy, and then we go away and take a step back and say, OK, what did Parliament want it to do and what would courts do to support Parliament's will here? So because it has these special secret procedures, there still needs to be some control over it, but these controls are very kind of distinct formal controls if they make a formal mistake as to the law, but not if they get it substantively wrong. Because Parliament has given it the powers to act here, you need secrecy. If you then go and have judicial review, you would not have the same procedures and processes. So it's a very different focus. The rule of law is there, but it's rule of law to support how Parliament has set out these provisions. A very different role. And that leads into a different content of the rule of law.
And that's one of the reasons there's a distinction between Lord Carnworth and Lord Sumption. So when uh, Mark Elliott was talking this through the case, in the first instance, you had this discussion of islands of law. What on earth do we mean by an island of law? And what we're trying to get at, and what Lord Carnworth picks up on as well, is when you go and look at the role of the IPT, it is taking decisions in its own specialist area. And it's going away and taking decisions on investigations of GCHQ. Is it justified for GCHQ, for example, and other intelligence services to go away and carry out phone tapping or computer tapping in certain circumstances? That's its specialist jurisdiction. But in doing so, it's interpreting legislation. When it goes away and interprets that legislation, it will interpret this legislation in a way that applies within the sphere of the IPT, but also because it's interpreting legislation that can apply beyond that, it is starting to make legal determinations that other courts might pick up on as well. This can then cause a problem, because if the IPT interprets a piece of legislation in a particular way, it's got its own little island of law. Because other tribunals and courts might go away and interpret the same piece of legislation in a different way. But if we do that, we have problems because we're not really upholding the rule of law. So we need a court to go away and check on the determinations of the IPT to stop this creation of little islands of law. We only maintain the rule of law if we have the court checking these determinations because what if the IPT determines the meaning of a legal provision in a particular way and that's different from what other courts and tribunals are doing. And it's that that pushes, I think, Lord Carnworth to a slightly different conclusion of what the rule of law requires. He's thinking about it in a different way as a background constitutional principle. He doesn't have the same role as thinking about it in terms of upholding the will of Parliament. And he has this kind of need, in a sense, to make sure we don't have these islands of law. And that's not present in Lord Sumption's judgment. So those differences push them in different directions. So that's getting us to think about the rule of law. What about the foundations of judicial review? What, if anything, is it telling us about these foundations of judicial review? And this is where it gets a bit complicated. So I'll try my best, but you'll probably, if it's anything like any other lecture I've given, you'll all look at me going, no, I'm sorry, I don't get it. So I will try my best to explain what's going on. When we go away and think about foundations of judicial review, we tend to think about it as some kind of battle between modified ultraviaries and common law. And it's an oversimplistic viewpoint. There are lots of different versions of modified ultraviaries. There are lots of different versions of common law. And there are other justifications as well. What I want us to think about is in terms of thinking about it when we raise issues to do with ouster clauses and when we raise issues with how we can remove judicial review. And there's kind of two ways of looking at Anna's Minnick. So we can look at Anna's Minnick and say what Anna's Minnick did was it told us that the reason this decision was a nullity and didn't exist, it was only a pretended purported determination, was because it was beyond the scope of its powers. It had no jurisdiction. And it's this distinction between jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional that grounds how judicial review works. And then what Anna's Minnick told us apparently, or at least we are told that's what it told us when we read Anna's Minnick through to Page, is that all legal errors are jurisdictional errors. So one way of looking at what's going on in Anna's Minnick is we have a distinction between, on the one hand, jurisdictional errors and non-jurisdictional errors. We have these two boxes, we find legal errors, and we say, okay, all legal errors go into the jurisdictional error box, the end. So what's grounding how it works is jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional. Another way of looking at Anna's Minnick is to say it started a shift away from seeing jurisdictional error and non-jurisdictional error as the grounding of how we think about these cases. It wasn't the case that the decision was only purported in Anna's Minnick because it made a jurisdictional error. The reason it was only purported was because it made a legal error. And that's what's important. That's what's really doing the work, the distinction between legal errors and non-legal errors. And we know that because that's how the case law moved. It moved towards seeing legal, factual as the main distinction. And we also know this because it ties into the rule of law, to draw it back to what we were talking to earlier. 
If you're going to make a legal error, then you're acting beyond the scope of your powers because you've made a legal error. You're acting beyond the rule of law. So we see it more in terms of the idea that law, non-law, is more important than jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional. And you can read the cases both ways, which is great fun for academics, not so much fun for everyone else. What, if anything, is this case telling us about that? And the answer is, they're disagreeing with each other. So it's not going to give you a resolution, but it helps you to understand why there might be this tension between these different approaches. Because if you go away and look at what Lord Calmworth is doing, he's thinking much more in terms of background rule of law principles, approaching this from a principled basis, and what seems to be pushing him is towards this understanding of its law that is doing the work, not jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional. And so he starts by kind of criticising this approach, and he doesn't like overly technical distinctions. And he keeps telling you that it's all about drawing on background principles, thinking about it pragmatically and principally. What would the rule of law need here? How do I focus on this? So for him, this understanding of law is more important than jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional. If you go away and look at how Lord Sumption approaches the case, it's different. Because for him, when Lord Sumption looks at Anis Minnick, he doesn't take a step back and say, oh, it's moved us to all legal errors of jurisdictional errors. He says, no, Anis Minnick moves the distinction, removes the distinction between an error of law in the face of the record and other errors of law. That's what it's doing. And really what's going on in Anis Minnick is jurisdictional, non-jurisdictional does the work. And then we say these types of legal errors are jurisdictional. So he thinks of it much more in terms of the scope of the power. And we can see this not just in the way in which they think about Anis Minnick, but also the way in which they reason later on and how they draw on these principles, particularly when we go back to how important is parliamentary intention. Because if you are Lord Calmworth, parliamentary intention is not unimportant, but it's more like a break. So you're going away and saying, I've got background constitutional principles, I'm going to reason in this way. And if I've got you know, clearly worded legislation that's going to get in the way, then I might respect that or find a way of a dictator of getting around it. Also, if you're Lord Calmworth, you have a general presumption at play when you're looking at the legislation. There's a general presumption that Parliament would not want to remove judicial review over either administrative bodies or inferior courts or tribunals. And that presumption plays a lot of work. And it's that presumption that pushes them to saying it's just not clear enough here. If you go away and look at Lord Sumption, his approach is very different. Let's look at the legislation. What is it telling us about the IPT? What is its role? What are its powers? Have we set up an appeal system here? That is playing a much more important role in working out how far we can go away and review decisions of the IPT. So he's much, having much more emphasis and weight on background legislation, much less emphasis on being pragmatic and principled in thinking through what the principles should be. If you go away and look at Lord Lloyd-Jones, he's kind of in the middle. He doesn't have a general presumption against judicial review being ousted over inferior courts and tribunals because they're different. They're tribunals. They can uphold the rule of law in a different sense because they're performing a judicial function. Nevertheless, the words were not clear enough here because he accepts the move from Anis Mimic to this idea that all legal errors are jurisdictional error, and this wasn't made clear that legal errors were going to be removed. This is where I confuse everyone by saying that just because all legal errors are jurisdictional doesn't mean that all jurisdictional errors are legal. That's essentially what they're drawing on. There are factual errors and legal errors, and so we can interpret it in different ways. So where does that leave us? It leaves us just as confused as we were when trying to interpret Annie's Minnick. So my hope is hopefully it will take us less than 50 years to work this out. But you never know. Thank you very much.
one with all the lights of your computer. <laughs> if some of you are allowed to ask questions, sweep away the confusion. Who'd like to start? Don't feel shy, don't feel into it. Uh, thank you for two very interesting talks. I, I'd like to ask Chris Elliott, if I may, whether he thinks there's a real distinction between the normative and conceptual accounts of sovereignty. Because it seems to me that if you're thinking about legal principles, as you said, and you have to work out how these principles operate together, you're both doing normative and conceptual work at the same time. But I find it hard to see what conceptual analysis could mean in this context, other than a normative grappling with the relevant principles, trying to see how they interact. But if that's right, then what Lord Sumption says about when he accepts the conceptual but not the normative may just be window dressing because he doesn't want to um, concede that absolute sovereignty is rather less straightforward than, than it's sometimes been taken for. He wants to leave open the conceptual possibility that Parliament could create some tribunal with unlimited jurisdiction, no restrictions, whatever. Um, but then he says, well, that would be a very strange thing for Parliament to want to do. And that's another way of saying we're never going to reach a statute in that way, because it would be, it would be wrong, it would be contrary to the rule of law, uh, it would be a start recognizing a creature that's not bound by law in the ordinary sense. So I wonder, you know, whether he can really rest on that distinction between the normative and the conceptual. If, if I'm right and it's really the same thing, then he's you know he's on he's skating on the slippery slippery surface. What do you think about that? I think I think that I think that I agree with the premise of the question at least because I, I think that when you start to dig into Lord Carnwell's judgments, um, so I, I do find it difficult. So if, if we were to accept, which which you don't, but if we were to accept that there is the conceptual and normative way of looking at things, um, I find it difficult to, to pigeonhole Lord Carnworth, because I think he says conflicting things if we stay within that paradigm, if we accept the paradigm. Um, that may in itself be telling, I suppose. But I think that when we start to dig further into Lord Carnworth's um, judgment, we do start to see the wheels come off this idea of a distinction between the purely conceptual, if you like, and then the, the, the normative. Because I think at one point, I think he is trying to present um, his way of looking at things in conceptual terms. But I think, as I said in my talk, I think as soon as he builds in the notion of abuse of power, um, we start to to think, well, does, doesn't that bring into play limitations that are beyond the merely conceptual? Um, and when I said at the end of my talk that it links into the foundations debate, what I had in mind there is that I suppose you could say, not that there are any of these people in the room, but if you were any kind of ultra-virus theorist, um, you might say, <laughs> well, of course, all of these substantive uh, norms that may condition the exercise of, uh, of power um, can nevertheless be understood in the final analysis as conceptual limitations that flow from the scope of the the power. Then I suppose you you can allow him to square that circle, but but um, that in itself uh, is, is perhaps you know it, it, I think it depends where you stand on on that on that issue. But I can see that if you if you don't buy into that way of looking at things then I, I see it's problematic to, to, to think of any clean distinction between the conceptual and the, the normative. But the question is a degree, I think, but maybe not type. Um, if I'm looking at the classification of, of Lord Carman's argument, I agree with, uh, with Mark that it's, it's, it looks conceptual and then slides into normative. I'm going to try and explain to you what I think uh, Lord Sumption and, and um, is getting at and what I was getting at was about this conceptual distinction. And I also think that what uh, Lord Sumption is really doing is, is practical rather than conceptual. So I would have Lord Wilson as conceptual, Lord Kahn as really normative, and Lord Sumption as practical. So the conceptual is because you're faced with a possible contradiction. So if we're thinking about it conceptually, Parliament is trying to create a tribunal 
with limited jurisdiction, limited powers, okay? If it then removes judicial review from that body, then essentially what you're saying is, I don't have to check you. So because nobody checks you, in essence, it's a bit like saying, you can decide for yourself what your jurisdiction is. And so that becomes a conceptual problem. So when I was trying to explain it in the lecture today, I was imagining parents saying to a child, you have, I'm going to set a curfew for you. So the parent is in charge and says, you have a curfew, teenage daughter. Okay. But then the parent says, oh, but you can set the curfew yourself whatever time you want. But I haven't really set a curfew for my daughter anymore. I've essentially said, you don't have a curfew because you can decide what your curfew is. It's exactly the same here, and that's what I think is coming across by conceptual. How can you be limited but determine the scope of your limits at the same time? You can't. That's a conceptual contradiction, so it's got to be one or the other. And that, I think, is a conceptual limit, which I think is where Lord Wilson is going. What I think Lord Sumption is trying to say is take it as a principle of interpretation. Practically, these are going to contradict each other. Now, surely, practically, Parliament is not going to do that. You're going to spot that. So practically, you're not going to see it. But also practically, if I can see that contradiction, I'm going to go away and look at the legislation and work out what I think Parliament wanted. Did Parliament really want to create a body that could determine the scope of its own jurisdiction? Or did Parliament really want that to be limited? And I will know that when I look at the legislation, see what powers were given to that body and see what else is there, like there was meant to be a possible appeal system that they haven't got around to setting up yet. All that will be important for me to work out which of these contradictory interpretations was actually the real one. So that's how I would see it. I don't know whether you would accept that as a conceptual normative distinction, but I, I do agree with Mark that I think Carmouth is really being normative, not conceptual. Well, I'm sorry, but I'd like to try and get some other questions in my way. Very interesting, but can we have a question that gives an easier answer I can understand? <laughs> <laughs> Who'd like, come on, let's have some questions. Interesting and difficult issues. Don't worry about, if you think it's simple, it, it may be, but it's worth asking. Yes, please, that's it. Thank you. Right. Um, in terms of the judgment, you as a legislator, how So, so you imagine, let's say the IPT decided it was going to judicially review uh, my decision to set you a 25,000 word essay for tomorrow. Okay, right. Okay. So completely beyond the scope, of, I'm not doing it, uh, but completely beyond the scope of its powers. Okay. Um, if you were then to kind of plug that into the different reasoning processes, the difficulty is how far will the ouster clause work? So if you look at Lord Wilson, he seems to be suggesting that that just wouldn't work. Okay. Um, because um, you are, you couldn't oust review for these pure jurisdiction issues. The things like, why was the IPT reviewing the decisions of a lecturer rather than reviewing what was going on with security services? So that's where he would go. Um, if you look at the way in which uh, you've got this competing interpretations of a specific clause, if it's calmness, you'd go away and say, well, this is excess and abuse and it's a legal error because you've legally misunderstood the scope of your powers, so that's not going to oust it either you made a legal mistake when interpreting the law, setting out what your powers is, and he'd sort of go down that route. Uh, if you're looking at um, the um, Lord Sumption, if you look at his specific way of interpreting Section 67, it's this idea of a kind of procedural mistake. So the example he gives us was the decision final when the decision had been determined by the court but not lodged. And they thought it was final, and he said, well, the court said, actually, no, it wasn't because it hadn't been lodged. It's that kind of mistake. And it wouldn't extend to this unless you could put to some kind of procedural error they made rather than the substance of their powers. And then you'd have to go down the legislation and say, what was really intended here? Did you want the IPT to review tutors or did you not? I don't think you did. So I can go away and tell you that's not in the scope of your powers. I think that's where he'd go. But it, it's, you're right, it's, it's not helping in some senses, 
but because it's so specific but so broad at the same time, it's really hard to pin down how it would apply to different causes. Yes, then from the very back. Um, my question is for Professor Yang. Um, let's say we accept that Lord Carlo um, uh, was quite correctly or to be taken as being more of the credit, mm -hmm. um, despite perhaps his blur of that line. But that seems compelling, but why is Lord Sumption not giving more of the credit? Because it just seems that one could interpret Lord Sumption, what he's actually doing is just starting with a different set of presumptions. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not thinking high to high he's saying something like it's unlikely that Harlow would do something. So he's starting with a different presumption. Mm -hmm. Much like Lord Carter has his own set of presumptions as he really recognizes. So it's all a more normative work, but both of them are sort of trying to cloak that mm -hmm. as though it's some sort of conceptual like added to some kind of purely legal thing. But the principle that they're disagreeing about principles, which they perfectly have. I, th I think I think it's it's important to recognise where uh, Professor Allen's question earlier was coming from. So, are they both doing normative things, or are they both working in some kind of abstract bubble in which normative principles never intrude? Well, of course, they've got different background constitutional principles driven by different normative conceptions of what they think is the proper role of the court. So, um, Mark Alec, when he set out the principles. <laughs> They all have different understandings of what do they mean by parliamentary sovereignty, what do they mean by rule of law, what do they mean by separation of powers, and they will be driven by different normative conceptions of those principles, of course. But what we were looking at was when you are trying to classify, is it the case that there is some kind of ouster clause parliament just could not do, that's where the split is. And yes, that's based by different background normative considerations, but that is then driving them to either come up with a normative restriction on Parliament based on these background principles or a conceptual one. Because if you put more weight on parliamentary sovereignty, it's going to be much harder for you to then say, on oh, no, the background principles of the rule of law that stop you doing this. So yes, different normative principles push in those different directions, but the nature of their limit is either conceptual or normative still for different reasons. I think just to add to that briefly, on, on the conceptual normative point, one way of thinking about it, it might be to take two clearly, well, Professor Allen might want to come back on this and disagree, but let, I would say these are, these are two clearly contrasting examples. So on the one hand, we might say, we might, we might accept the view that um, a sovereign parliament cannot bind its successors. On the other hand, there might be a suggestion that parliament cannot enact legislation that breaches the fundamental right to freedom of expression, okay? They would seem to me to be two different kinds of limits on parliamentary authority. One is explicitly normative, but the first one I would think of as conceptual because it is something that flows from the very conceptual nature or it flows from one understanding of the very conceptual nature of what it means for a legislature to have um, sovereign or unlimited authority. And then I think what this case is, is, is putting into focus is the question, well, OK, if it's the case that Parliament can't oust, or if it's the case that to some extent Parliament can't oust judicial review, can we categorise it as one or other of those things? Is it is it more like the restriction that says a sovereign parliament can't bind its successors, or is it more like the restriction which says parliament cannot pass legislation that restricts certain fundamental um, human rights? And so to me, that's what the, 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 this distinction about conceptual versus normative is, is about. And I, I think you can see from the judgments that, that it, it's actually quite difficult to map the ouster clause question onto that um, distinction. Okay, I'll stick up for Philip's sale. <laughs> um, that you're all thinking about this in a very static way, yeah. as if Parliament doesn't come back. <clears throat> so if Parliament writes a stupid ouster clause that allows some tribunal uh, set up to deal with this kind of matter to review the decisions of lecturers to say, hey, something. Or starts hearing talk 
objects that he's all doing what he likes. Um, there's surely Parliament that this will change it. <coughs> and it's the, the, it's the court's job to say if Parliament has been obvious errors, mm. or should the court just say, well, you know, that's your business, but it's up to you to change it. Um, I should say, by the way, for the benefit of all the students here, this is not the law now. I did and point the, that out. The, 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 the Congress judgment starts start oh. with a legal error. He says, Section 678 provides, mm. and then he reads out what it uses to say before that exactly. exactly. right? yeah. um, the But that just shows yeah. the world has moved on. There is mm. now an appeal. And if you look at the, 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 the parliamentary debates about the 2016 bill, everyone was assuming then that there would be an appeal. I think that the, the, the then Solicitor General, and now the, uh, the Chancellor, uh, was very uh, proudly saying, we have provided for an appeal. But doesn't that... But, so there's, there's, but the, the big question is the dramatics, right? right. The, that, that okay, but that cuts both ways, doesn't it? Because um, so I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm generally comfortable with what bits of this judgment must... I mean, if, if you wanted to press the point, you could say, well, didn't Parliament do precisely that? You know, you had an as minic and you had the Foreign Compensation Act, mm -hmm. which talked about uh, the court not interfering with determinations. Mm -hmm. And so Parliament retaliates and it says, OK, well, now, not determinations, yeah. including determinations as to jurisdiction. I don't actually think that anybody can be in any doubt what was in the parliamentary draftsman's mind when those words were used. And as Minnick was in his or her mind, mm -hmm. and this Elster Clause was drafted, uh, it seems yeah. to me, specifically to address the judgment of the House of Lords in and as Minnick. So in terms of the dynamics, it would seem to me that that, that clearly points towards uh, the majority view in Privacy International being, um, o on that sort of analysis, problematic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can I just take that general line? Yeah, I can come back. Yeah. Um, so, so, were you just discussing about um, this sort of issue that it does seem very clear that they really did want this to be judicial review? So, does there come a point in sort of statutory construction at which the courts would have to make a decision to sort of go the mile and say, okay, we're going to strike down this law or sort of buy the trigger on this sort of. Uh, mutually assured destruction type thing being more of one sovereignty? Or are we sort of in a scenario where courts will entertain increasingly ludicrous things so they can maintain the status quo? And at what point do we move from one to the other? Do you understand? Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, I think one example is the, um, so when, um, Mark was setting out the, the context. You had the, the infamous immigration bill, which was trying to oust absolutely everything by listing all sorts of things that purported and legal errors and other things, and did do a complete job of removing judicial review in that particular area. So I think we have to kind of distinguish between two possible scenarios. So if you look at the kind of AXA Jackson scenario, that is a scenario where Pond has come along and said, you know those courts, you know those kind of judicial review things they do? We just got rid of them. So this is kind of like abrogating everything. Sort of. So that's the suggestion that if you did something that completely removed judicial review totally, then yes, that's when you'll start reaching for the nuclear button and saying that is just something you can't do. That's something we're not going to recognise. They wouldn't be there to recognise it. So I'm not quite sure how this works. But this is the idea that that, that kind of extreme scenario, those exceptional circumstances and they tie into undermining the foundations on which the constitution is based and often tie into suggesting that this was a complete abrogation of how democratic processes are meant to work so you've got that extreme circumstance the question is what you do with all these different things in between what if you have a clause that does its best to remove every single form of judicial review or that does this that sort of looks as though it's trying to get rid of judicial review by picking up on Anis Minnick putting in the special magic words and hoping this means you can ask judicial review. And then along comes the court saying the special magic words didn't work because actually they're not the right special magic words. Off you go again and find the new special magic words that will go away and remove judicial review in these circumstances. I think the way to think about it is when you're dealing with the special magic words scenario, you can have this element of dynamic interactions. You go away, you pass a clause, the courts go away, interpret it, Parliament can respond and that can keep going round. I think in those circumstances, courts should keep interpreting, but be aware of the fact that they are interpreting and there could be a possible limit, but Parliament can come back. 
if it gets to the complete nuclear destruction scenario, I think you are thinking about the exceptional circumstances where democracies disappeared, judicial review and the entire courts are trying to be removed, and the courts come along and say, no, I'm sorry, I don't think in these extreme circumstances we're going to recognise that as law. And that's the clearest I can do to come with a distinction, but it's a vague line. I think all I would add, and I'm conscious that there's a lecture in here, I think, at six o'clock, so maybe we have to finish now, but... Um, all I would add, I think, is that the, the, the judges admit that they that they know what they're doing uh, sometimes. So Lord Phillips, I think it was, I think it was Lord Phillips, um, shortly after he retired, was giving evidence to a parliamentary committee. And he referred to uh, cases like Anna's Minnick, and he said sometimes courts will ascribe to legislation a meaning that they know it cannot bear. And they do this, uh, in effect, as an act of political dialogue as much as anything else it, it's sort of it's it's saying to parliament sorry to parliament get yeah, back back into your court now you, you deal with this it's what we're saying we think it means even though we don't really think it means that now you decide uh, what you what you want to to do with it so i do think that it forms part of that that back and forth that we can't actually if we try to understand it purely in terms of a, a, of a legal analysis rather than a broader sort of small p political analysis or an institutional analysis, we, we miss some of what's um, going on, I think. Can I just give David a chance? I know he wants to say something. Just to, to take up a point that Professor Howard's made, one reason for um, not moving into Parliament to sort it out is that Parliament, when it legislates, typically doesn't do it retrospectively. It doesn't give a remedy. But I, I think that in terms of the, uh, the, the statutory interpretation, it's more a green signal assumption this is about statutory interpretation, but not one of the seven actually adopted anything that could be described <laughs> as a <laughs> and finally, this comes again to what 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 Howard said. It isn't correct, I think, on a plain meaning approach, that the terms of the legislation that were used by the parliamentary draftsmen were sufficient to reverse sanctions. Because what it is limited to is decisions as to whether they have jurisdiction, as to whether the tribunal has jurisdiction, not as to whether the person the tribunal is reviewing. And so the real question here that was raised before the tribunal was not a question as to whether the tribunal had jurisdiction, it's a question as to whether the foreign secretary had jurisdiction. It seems to be quite clear, but that, that raises the question of why the majority didn't simply say that. <laughs> Too many questions. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Can we thank both speakers?